Invite the young people to come forward this time, please. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see you all. I know. Uh, Cassandra's off camping, and, and Jeff's probably running around with the other ones today, so we know where he's at. We can pray for him and the family that uh, they all stay safe. Well, today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about inheritance. I brought my will, my, my, actually my parents' will, to me. So when my parents died, my mother died last year, uh, they had a will which basically said, this is what you do with what, what they own the remains and how to separate it out. So here's the actual will of what went on with my folks' inheritance, that is what they had. You know, and, and my dad was in his 80s, my mother is in his, like almost 90 years old. So over the years, they had a few things and they then told article after article, well, this is how I want to separate out. Now, it sounds like a lot more than it really is in terms of what they, they didn't have that much, but they did have some things and, and it is then, what they offered to not myself only, but to my brothers, and then to their children, and to their grandchildren. And this is what stipulates that. Well, at some point, what they gave us, at least in terms of the physical stuff, it's gonna pass away, right? I like to have you think about this being another will, being the Bible. It's God's will for you and I. Unlike this, the stuff that my folks have given to me and my brothers and my family, eventually we're out. This one has a different kind of what I will give you if you're open to the Spirit of God, eternal life, a sense of God's love throughout your life. Now, if you had to choose between one or the other, thankfully I don't have to, but if you had to, which do you think might be a bit more important? <laughs> this one or this one? What do you think? This one. Okay, I'd have to agree with you that... that something that doesn't perish, a sense of connection and love that we are growing with each other, the love that you have for your family, we're told is eternal. And that God wants to continue that in your life this day and beyond this life. So I want you to think about that. Now, reading through this isn't, well, it's, some of the words in here are kind of interesting. It's like, well, uh, let's see. I find them that they can put you to sleep after trustees directed to do this, trustees to do that, notice of beneficiaries, and, and on and on the wording goes. Sometimes you could read that at nighttime and maybe put you to sleep. Sometimes people find reading the Bible puts you to sleep too because there are different kinds of stories here. So 
For instance, if you're watching maybe TV, there's some of those, some things that get your attention, right? And other things you're like, really? Do I have to sit through this? My parents are making me watch it. That never happens. No, okay. <laughs> but there are some times when we have things that are a little bit, well, the Bible has, is actually a compilation or a gathering of a bunch of books. It isn't just one book. You might think of it as being one book, but it's actually a bunch of different books. So we, that's why it has different names. So you have different names in here. And so I would encourage you to say, you know, if this book, you're reading that little book. Now there's a really short book called Philemon in the, near the end of the Bible. It's maybe page and a half. You could read that one probably, and you could stay awake through it. Now, if you read other ones, no. And why I'm telling you that is because sometimes people come to it and they go, oh my gosh, I never would read this. But again, remember, this is God's testimony, God's inheritance for you. So you can come to know the presence of God in this life and carry you forward. The other one, like I say, eventually wears out. So my encouragement for you over life is for you to learn a bit more about the one who created the universe, the one who holds you in love right now, and hear what he would have to say to you in these moments. And when you're struggling or when things are good, God's still there with you. Holy One, I thank you for these young people, that they have such a rich inheritance, one that they may see through their family, but also one that you've given them through Jesus is coming. May they come to know your love for them and your inheritance for them, not just in this life, but in the next. May that be true for each day for them. We pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to invite you to stand for our next uh, hymn. And in between that, I'm going to invite you to, to do a uh, reading, uh, this side and this side, as we then do a little bit of the, one of the book of Psalms, if you would stand at this time. you to continue stand, to stand as we then, this side will uh, say the first verse and then we'll just go back and forth. So if you would, choir. Who shall come into the presence of the Lord? This side. Who shall be welcomed in his presence? Those who have not hurt others by their deeds and are innocent in their desires. Who do not puff themselves up by what they have or do. They speak truthfully in all their dealings. God's favor will be upon them. God will rescue them when they have need. God is our healer, strength, and friend. Let's continue with our next hymn then. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In Him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. 
He's my deliverer, in Him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. Please be seated. Lift up your hearts. Our first reading comes from Romans chapter 15. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by encouragement of the scriptures, we may, might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Holy One, may we, with steadfastness and sense of strength, come to know you all the more through those scriptures you've left for us as our inheritance. And as we do so, then, may our stories and your stories come together as we see you transforming our lives and the world around us, we pray. Amen. Now, behind... Uh, the parsonage, there are two big trees, and they're beautiful trees. The only thing is, is that during most of the day, there's, there's so much shade, you can't plant anything under them. So I have thoughts about, well, it would be wonderful to plant some lilies, or even the rose bushes that are there kind of choking out because there's so much shade. And it's sort of like, oh, you know? And so I've been actually hacking away a little bit at getting the, the bottom branches a little higher so the shade would be less, for at least for the flowers and plants underneath them. But in, in the same way, we have our lives where we have all the stuff that goes on in our lives. So doctor appointments, going to work, or cleaning, watching TV, calling relatives, buying food, and on goes the list. It's sort of like our tree is full of stuff. Understandable stuff, but that's often our life in our trees. But I would suggest to you that God would like to plant something in us that we need to have some place there God planting seeds. As it said in the reading, for whatever was written in former days is written for our instructions. It is written as seed for our souls. If our tree is so full of all this stuff, how is the light of God going to break in to plant something new in our life? And that's a challenge I think each one of us face, that, that our trees are so full of things, whether it's uh, the call, the phone, or, or aches and pains, whatever it might be, are we willing to let God's seed grow in us? It says that there needs to be a steadfastness about reading and, and growing in that way. Who shall come into the presence of the Lord? You just recited that. Who shall come? There's a certain level of steadfastness. That's why we have rituals in the church. The Lord be with you. He is risen. He is risen he, these are rituals that, that I invite you to participate in. It's sort of like a bicyclist that you, you practice them, and they, they help you build muscle, help you to get a sense of, okay, what are we about? Our Father who art in heaven, it, those are sort of these rituals to help guide us, to build muscle in us, that we're not just cast a lo uh, uh, a loose. We are brought into God's presence as we learn these rituals, but also more than just rituals, they help center us. Who walks with us? Who wants us to know the reality of his presence in our life? And so we come to a similar vision as we learn those things. We, those of you maybe that were looking up in, uh, last week to see the solar eclipse, or the, yeah, the solar eclipse, you know, to get the same vision together. 
is what we're calling. Last week I mentioned the idea of having a vision that God's calling us to. Well, if we're all scattered and looking at our trees all the time, there's no way we're going to have a vision. We're going to have probably 60 different visions. And so I think what God is calling us to do is, what are we going to have our vision centered in? And reading the scriptures, letting the scriptures read us, brings us together, I would suggest, in a clear sense of a common vision of what we have for us as we go together. The creator of the universe is giving us a common vision. How cool is that? But we have to be open to receive that. We have to make space in our lives to allow that to be accomplished. Our basic message that we're called to, 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 to germinate in our life is, you know, yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his beloved son. Or you could say, God loves the world so much, right? It isn't just loved. God loves you and I. And that that spirit continues into our life and can make huge changes if we allow God to move in those ways. Jesus gave us an example. He gave us an example of the cross to change the world. It wasn't by the sword, we're told, but by what? Laying our lives down in love for one another around us. That the world has changed. You know, part of me, you know, it's, it would be a lot easier if we could just manhandle persons or, you know, I'm going to rustle you to the ground and say, this is what you're going to do. But it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a long inside a person. And I grew up in Detroit, and I had a few tussles over the times growing up in Detroit. But, you know, that is based in fear. It's based in pushing and authority. You know, but love draws us. And so one of the lessons we're called to learn is about fear and how God doesn't call us out of fear, but God calls us to respond in love. Fear, though, can control us. This last week I was talking to a young woman who, who has had horrible experiences growing up. Her parents kicked her out, her, and some of you met her met her boyfriend, he was screaming at her, and a lot of the decisions she was making and our mate is making right now is based on fear. Well, what if no one's there? What if this happens? What is that? And it's understandable. But we're not called to live our lives based in fear. And how we do that is we are called to have different stories for ourselves. We're called to, to draw upon the well of the stories that God has given us in lives that have preceded us and in our own lives. So, for instance, many of you know the story of Samson and David, right? I mean, you see, David and Goliath, sorry. I'm going to give you a quiz afterwards. <laughs> so, David and Goliath. It's kind of a fun story as a kid, you know? You know, David is, is the youngest of the family, which, again, starts the whole parameter of, well, the oldest is the one supposed to, God's supposed to call him, but instead God chooses David and uh, there's all that that happens with David. But David is there. He's out tending sheep. You know, he's young. You're kind of like talking about a kid. All the other brothers have gone to march off to war. And Goliath, we're told, is what? This big, huge guy that intimidates the Israeli troops or the Hebrew people, taunting them. Isn't there anybody out there that can take me on? <laughs> you know? None of you, you're all like ants before me, right? And there's that whole dynamic that's set up in the story of being taunted and fear. Now, as a kid, you might have heard that story and go, okay, well, eventually we know what happens. David is actually able to, to overcome Goliath. But what's more important, I would suggest, is what is being said in that? What happens with the fear that goes on? Does David let fear control him? You know he's got to be afraid, at least some level, and he goes there. you got this whole army on one side of the army. You kinda, I'm sure even the, the Hebrew people are going, you know, what is this kid doing? So he had to overcome taunts. He had to overcome that sense of, well, what am I going to do? But he also had memory that, you know, out tending the sheep, he had dealt with possibly bears maybe mountain lions. So he had dealt with some pretty horrific things already in terms of protecting his sheep. And what is this guy? But he also had faith. He had faith that God was with him. 
He had a faith, a sense that God was calling him to do this, and so he stood up to this man with individual. Now you could say, oh, it's just a nice story. And I'm sure probably a lot of kids do. That's kind of an interesting story. But it's supposed to be one of the stories that we internalize about our lives around fear. That we don't let fear control us. We don't let fear drive us to do things that God doesn't call us to do. But in fact, God's love empowers us to be different. And so those stories that you've heard growing up in the Bible are not just stories that are, oh, yeah, those are little nice antidotes. Those stories are there for you to, to remember, to learn, to also act differently. I am a people who have stories that root me. So what stories root you? What are those stories that connect you to this life? I mean, I was talking yesterday with someone about flying. I got lots of stories of flights that have gone wrong. And we can easily talk about uh, travel and all the flight stories and forget that, you know, it was a good vacation. You know? You can talk about going somewhere and you can talk about all the painful things that happened and forget there were some good moments. What roots you? Or you can have an incredible Thanksgiving meal and let's say at the very end, the pumpkin pie gets burned a little bit. And what do you remember? The burnt pie? Yeah. And so we are called to have stories that root us. Yeah, there are other stories that are tragic, but the ones that are, are called to ground us are stories like this, not because of David just overcoming glass, but where do you face fear in your life, for instance? Are you going to let it dominate and control you, or are you going to believe that God is with you? Your inheritance as a child of God to go forward. It doesn't mean that, you, that fears aren't rears, but you don't let them control you. You have the courage to go forward, even as David did, to face those struggles. And again, you have to realize that you probably have gotten a lot of tapes that have said otherwise. I'm sure David did, and David continued to get them as, and who do you think you are? Why are you doing this? But he had that inner drive that God gave him. And that's what we're called to cultivate, to let those seeds germinate in us. In Philippians, it says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Well, how cool is that? So you have, it doesn't say you don't have them. It says, what do you do with them? Let them be shaped into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and slow you down. It's a wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life with what? Peace. We're told the peace of Christ that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds. That is not a joke. That is what we're called to know, come to the reality that as we go to prayer, we go to the coming awareness of God in our life that those things then are, become second place to what? God's presence and God's peace. Okay, I mentioned I grew up in Detroit. So I was, went, grew up through the rise of 67 where it was a huge racial upset. My dad got knifed, and this guy that was racially motivated tried to kill him. Things were not always pleasant for me, so I go off with my kids. I'm called to go back to seminary. I go to Dayton, to, uni, uh, to the seminary there. I park the car, and I'm told, you better put a, a bar on the steering wheel because someone might steal it. And you don't want to go too far from campus because there's shootings out there. I just visited another seminary where, you know, it was a beautiful setting. They had a little area for my kids to play in. It just was a beautiful context. And I'm thinking, you know, that'd be really nice for them. But when I got to this other place, that's where I felt God called me to be. In spite of, yes, people were dying a block from there, from gunshots. Yes, there were things being stolen from the campus. But that's where God was calling me. When I talked to other seminarians, one woman said to me, yeah, I know I walk about two blocks from here. I know I could kill, but I want to spread the love of Jesus. And so she did. Fear did not overcome her. Faith allowed her to go forward, and she continued in ministry. And as for myself, it was a wonderful experience at that particular seminary. 
The irony is when I'm driving home, I look at Denise and I said, and she says, don't talk to me about it. Because she knew too, that's the place we were called to be. We could have let fear control us. We could have gone to the other one. I guarantee you that experience would not have been very well experience, would not have been a very good experience for us. We can let fear control us or overcome fear with the Spirit of God. Again, I, I would suggest as you prayerfully enter into it, God's presence displaces the worry at the center of your life. We're told in 1 John 4, love, not fear driven. Now we hear sometimes in the Bible, the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. I would suggest that it's not exactly the greatest translation. I mean, the reverence of the Lord is really what should be placed there. And for some people, maybe fear is not a bad thing, particularly if all they've ever experienced is greed and people around them, and it might shake them up. But as you grow in faith and, and experience of God, that's not supposed to be the driving factor. Love is, should under guard what we are about. We're told, not fear, faith, hope, and love. And what is the greatest? Love. Love is undergirding what we do in this place, folks. Faith and hope go along with that. But we don't need faith when we see what is face to face, when we come in the presence of God fully revealed. We don't need faith at that point. We don't need any more hope in the sense of hope has been realized. Love will be eternal for us. And fear will depart. So as a church, I would invite you to think about what vision we have for the future. Are we so rooted in our stories of what God has done to see our own lives wedded with them and then be able to move forward into that vision wherever that may take us, knowing that fear will try to push us, but we will not, I would hope, not be overcome by it, but love will be stronger. Amen? Yeah. Lord, you know that fear is, knocks at the doors many days for all of us, but we pray that love will be deeper in us, that love will call us beyond that, that we will not be overcome, but overcome that we'll have hope in the face of those places where there's despair, where we have challenges, that you will give us the strength to go beyond that. And like David, our stories will be told in the future because you have moved in our lives as well. And the new stories are written of your action in this life, we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd ask my offertory helpers to... Uh, stand, and we're going to again pass the plates at this time. Over the years, I've wondered about offerings. I know some people go, oh my goodness, you know, they're just trying to keep the place going. And there's a reality, they cost, there is a cost here, but again, as I've reminded you, our offering to this community is far more than just what we do with our finances. It's, it's about being a people of faith sharing the love with folks that come in the front door or the rear door or the side door or call us on the phone. And to that degree, I would invite you to lay down your lives as we join together to share God's presence to those around us. And God gives you the opportunity to participate through that. I also would suggest that if you have a rough things going on in your life, write down a piece of paper and drop in an offertory plate because it isn't just physically, where all of our lives then are called to be placed before God, we'll continue to hold, hold those things in prayer as well. They're learning how to do this. So we're going to ask them to come forward and pass the plates as we're doing this, as she's playing.
Please stand as we then offer our offertory hymn. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator of the universe, our light and our salvation. Before the sun shone and the earth was formed, you alone dwelt. You created from the void and penetrated the darkness with light. Then your spirit moved over the face of the waters, and you brought order and form and life from the dust of the earth. Out of love, you formed all that is and placed us as stewards of the earth. However, we repeatedly turned away from you, corrupting the very gift you've given us. Yet your great love has remained steadfast. When the time was right, you sent your son Jesus to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. And his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him and revealed him as your beloved son. With your spirit upon him, he overcame the power of sin and death. Your spirit anointed him to bring your message of hope, help to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, healing to the brokenhearted. Through his action, the sick were healed, the hungry were fed, the sinners were transformed, the dead were raised, and by his baptism, death, and resurrection, you then gave birth to the church delivering us from the slavery to sin and death, which divides our spirits and very life. However, through his covenant signed by his blood, we have been reconnected to you and each other. Because of this, at his ascension, you exalted him and had him sit at your right hand. We were, according to his, the promise, he is always with us, baptizing us with his spirit and fire. Therefore, with your people on earth, and in all ages, let us join together in saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Again, the cross stood before him, but he then gathered with his disciples. And around the table again, he broke bread, giving thanks, and saying to them and to us, Take heed all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you knowing that at times we will turn away. He then took the cup, demonstrating to them, his disciples as well to us, that we too are called to be a people of forgiveness, but also people that are forgiven. Raising the cup, he said, take, drink, all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. Do so in memory of me. Holy One, as we gather again around this table, may your spirit be upon these gifts and upon all who gather here. May we know both your forgiveness, but also your affirmation as your love extends to us even now. Transform our lives and our ways that we too may live as a people that have received the inheritance of eternal life and that we need not be afraid as we face the challenges of day to day. But you walk with us. Help us to walk with you, we pray. Amen. I would invite you then, if you'd like to receive a communion in the back, again, we have the cups in the back, but if you'd like to come forward, I invite you to do so at this time. It again, it is an open communion for those who humbly repent of their sins and turn towards God.
Holy One, we are thankful again for this gift of your divine presence and this mystery. May the antidote uh, to this world's toxin be healed in us so that we might again deliver the good news in our lives and how we then share your presence. Again, thank you for this gift. We are unworthy, but it, again, you reach out to us. Thank you, Father and friend. Amen. I invite you to stand at this time as we sing our, our closing hymns. Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, may your blessings be upon your people gathered here. May they know the route that they travel, they travel not alone, but you accompanying them, giving them strength and hope, and telling us not to be afraid. Amen. We believe in crucifixion, we believe in 
coming back again, we believe.